welcome everyone to today's session of our survivorship series led by Stephanie Myers from the Zakem Center for Integrative Therapies. This program is hosted by the Blum Resource Center. Over at the Blum, we are grateful to the survivorship and Zakem teams for their continued partnership. This recording of the session will be posted on our Blum YouTube playlist and our Blum Digital Resource Center, as well as the survivorship and my Zakem website. For those of you watching live, if you have any questions related to today's program, please feel free to utilize the chat feature throughout the session. At the end of the session, those questions and any more that come through will be used to moderate a Q&A. If you have any other questions or would like more information about resources and programs offered through the Blum, please visit our website, www.dana-farber.org slash resource center, or email us at blum underscore center at dfci.harvard.edu. We will also have a poll for the live attendees at the end of this that will, at the end of the session that I will launch when I stop recording. Thank you all for joining us. I will now pass the workshop over to Stephanie. Thank you so much, Becca and Lauren. It's a pleasure to be with you all. Um, and my hope today for the next 40 minutes or so is to talk through with you some of the most common questions I get working with people who are experiencing cancer and in survivorship mode. And while I may not get to every myth and fact in the next bit of time we have together, I really want to encourage you to be as participatory as you can. So if you have a question about what I'm saying, or you have another myth you'd like me to try to myth bust while we have time together, please don't be shy. Like Becca said, you can put your question in the Q&A or the chat anytime during the conversation, and we'll get to as many of those as we can. So I want to begin by encouraging everybody to think through as we, as we think about where we can go to get reliable nutrition information. There is so much information if you just open up a Google search and type in, does sugar feed cancer? It can feel completely overwhelming. Um, and what I really hope to do today is to separate myth from fact and to give you some action steps. So on the topic of sugar and cancer, what's the bottom line and what can you do about it as you, as you move through uh, in your own family life, your own personal life and your family life. So the first thing to do is for you to know uh, one place you can go online to find reliable information about questions you may have going forward. So I'm showing you here a link to the American Institute for Cancer Research, where there's a lot of information on topics that you can put into the search um, bar at the top and get really clear evidence-based guidelines on your questions. And this particular um, project, the, the American Institute for Cancer Research, combined with the World Cancer Research Fund is sort of where the, where the the storehouse, if you will, of recommendations around nutrition and physical activity as they pertain to cancer risk and cancer survivorship. I wanna briefly tell you that this is 140 scientists in 17 different countries who, have, who are continuously, just like the name suggests, continuously looking at the research, the latest research, and pulling together recommendations from now more than 10,000 different scientific papers. It's not just focused on cancer prevention, as you see here, but also what, what to do about things, uh, nutrition and physical activity after a diagnosis of cancer. And that's where our focus is gonna be to get today. And here are the five myths we're gonna cover. And I think, as I said before, these are the, probably the five most common myths I'm asked about. Sugar, dairy, soy, meat, red meat, and processed meats, and supplements. So I'm going to go one by one through these myths as and versus facts. And again, as I said, if you have questions or another topic you hope we can get to, don't be shy about putting that into the chat. So let's start with the number one question I'm asked every day, which is, does sugar feed cancer? The short answer to that is no, but there's more to the story than that. So let's start with the short answer, which is that sugar doesn't feed cancer. What I mean by that is if you eat a piece of birthday cake or a donut, that does not, that, that, that molecule, those molecules of sugar don't get into your bloodstream and preferentially feed cancer cells. So let's start with that. And let's also start by acknowledging that glucose, which is another word for sugar, is the fuel for all of the cells in your body. So for you to be sitting here right now, paying attention, your heart's beating, you're thinking, you're, you're getting through your day, it's requiring you to have glucose. You cannot get zero glucose. Even if you cut out every bit of sugar, I, I meet a lot of people who say, well, I'm not eating sugar anymore. Or I, I even meet people who say I'm not eating blueberries or carrots or carbohydrates because they have sugar. Even if you cut out every carbohydrate in your diet, 
you will still get glucose because it's that important for your body to function. And if you don't eat it, your body gets it from other places. For example, your liver, your muscles, the body stores glucose just for those very times when people don't eat it. So it's not to say we're promoting sugar, but it's definitely for you to start to think about that there's a difference between the types of sugar we might eat and the, that is where the relationship to cancer may, may be. Now this last <laughs> sentence here on this slide is, can feel a little clunky. So I'm gonna break it down for you. The, the concern with sugar is that chronic, so regular over time eating added sugars can lead to excess production of hormones in the body like insulin and insulin-like growth factor. This is where that sound bite you might hear that sugar feeds cancer is way too simplified. It's a more complex story than that. And that's what I'd like to explain to you now. And to do that, I'm gonna use the example of a donut and an orange, both of which have 10 grams of sugar. The donut has 10 grams of added sugar and an orange has about 10 grams of naturally occurring sugar. These are two very different things and they're not broken down or used in the same way in the body. Let's take the donut first. If you were to eat a donut, the 10 grams of added sugar in the donut do not have any other helpers along the way. For example, there's no grams of fiber in the donut and there are zero phytonutrients. Phytonutrients, phyto is the Latin word for plant. Phytonutrients are nutrients that are in plant-based foods that have disease protective effects and benefits. So a donut, unfortunately, doesn't have any of those. Even with the orange glaze here on top, it's really, none of these things are providing the same type of colorful benefit we get from an orange, which contains 170 phytonutrients, I mean, in one orange, and three grams of fiber. What that means is not only does the orange have naturally occurring sugar, but when we eat an orange, because of the fiber, and in part the phytonutrients, our blood sugar doesn't spike the same way as it would from eating an added sugar, same amount of added sugar, like 10 grams of added sugar in a donut. So that's the first thing to think about that when we eat foods, it's not just sugar alone, but what else is the sugar in context with? Is there fiber? Is there protein? Is there something to mitigate that rise in, um, in blood sugar? When we eat a food that contains added sugar, our body secretes insulin. And the role of insulin is to bring our blood sugar back into a healthy range. That's a normal physiological thing that happens in the body all day long. The problem, like I mentioned before, is that chronic intake, chronic high intake of added sugar, meaning lots of added sugar every day over time, can create a situation where the body starts to pump out more insulin in anticipation of having added sugar on a regular basis. And that condition is, can, cre can create an environment in the body that's more favorable to cancer. So as you can see, this is a complicated story. The first thing we wanna have you thinking about is when you're eating sugar in your diet, where's that sugar coming from? As I mentioned before, sugar can come from any food that contains carbohydrate. So whole wheat bread, quinoa, sweet potatoes, fruit, those naturally occurring sugars are not the types of sugars to limit or eliminate. On the other hand, added sugars are the thing we wanna be paying attention to. You can see here on the right hand side, hand side of the slide, I've circled in red for you where you can find information on a nutrition label about how much added sugar is in a food. So in this particular um, yogurt, you can see that the yogurt has 10 grams of added sugar. Now, this is one action step you can walk away with today. And I'd encourage you to think about that because the American Heart Association has established guidelines for how much added sugar is recommended. And for women, it's 24 grams or less a day. So you can see that this one serving of yogurt, a flavored yogurt with 10 grams of added sugar would be close to half of what would be recommended in the day. And you can also start to look at labels for added sugar other places. So obviously things like soda or sugar sweetened beverages are entirely added sugar. They'll have really high numbers on that line. But other foods you might not think about as much like bread, salad dressing, crackers, chips, 
these are places if you if you're inclined to take action toward sugar in your diet or you've heard about it or thought about it or worried about it even the action step is actually quite simple it's a matter of not restricting fruits vegetables and whole grains and not eliminating those things from your diet because they contain natural sugar, but rather sort of dialing your attention toward where added sugar might be coming from on a regular basis in your eating pattern. And as I mentioned, the action steps around sugar. So, so let me just sum up here by saying sugar doesn't feed cancer, but regular intakes of added sugar can lead to a conditions where your body's producing more insulin and insulin is a growth factor. We need insulin. We can't have zero insulin. We need glucose. We can't have zero glucose. But what we can do is look at where added sugars come from in our diet and do our best to reduce our total intake of added sugar to less than 24 grams a day for women, less than 36 grams per day for men. You see here, I just left it at 24 grams a day. That's because I really do want to encourage. I mean, when it comes to added sugar, less is more. Okay. A couple of other takeaways here, which don't count fruit as added sugar no restriction on fruit. We will talk in a bit about how the recommended um, daily intake of fruit is two servings a day, but things like oranges and bananas and berries, those things are not something to cut back on because they contain sugar. It's a naturally occurring sugar. And that brings us to the final question, which is, but what do we do about dessert? So dessert is not something that has to be eliminated. I would recommend when you have a sweet or treat, if possible, eat it with a meal. So Eating sugar at a time when you've had fiber or protein also helps slow down that insulin spike I spoke of earlier. And lastly, if possible, homemade versions of sweets and treats are going to be best because you can actually control the amount of added sugar you put into a recipe. And just a quick kitchen hack, most recipes you find, you can actually cut the sugar up to 50%. If you cut it 30%, you'll, you'll almost always have success but up to 50%, you can reduce sugar and still have a baked good um, turnout like, like you, you know, without sacrificing the flavor and pleasure. The thing I would mention about that is that sugar is a bulking agent in recipes in addition to a sweetener. So, you know, if you've ever tried this and gotten cookies that are just like totally pancake thin, that's because sugar offers bulk to food, not just sweetness. I will also say that on my Zakum, our wellness platform, we have a lot of links to recipes that have a lower amount of added sugar. So sweets, treats, desserts, things that are family friendly that have lower, amount, lower amounts of added sugar. All right, so that's myth number one. Let's move on to myth number two, which is that dairy causes cancer. Or if you have cancer, you need to el eliminate or avoid dairy. So what does the research suggest about dairy? And, and I'm gonna actually just, um, highlight something here that I'm sure has been your experience if you've tried to, like I said before, Google anything online about nutrition and cancer. It is almost always possible to find a research study that says one thing, and then a research study that completely contradicts that. So if that is your experience, when you try to look up things online or ask questions about nutrition and cancer, you're not alone. That's because actually the research does sometimes contradict itself. And this is a great example. Meaning on the left in the blue box, you can see here, this is an evidence-based fact that dairy intake and calcium supplements protect against colorectal cancer. And on the right, you can see that excess calcium intake more than 1500 milligrams a day may actually increase the risk of certain types of prostate cancer. It's mind boggling to try to keep up with this, isn't it? So I wanna just put the bottom line before you today. And the bottom line is that for most types of cancer, dairy products are not a major risk. And for the types of dairy that may have risk associated, it's almost always high fat dairy in quantities that are more than two servings a day. I'm gonna say that again. There are a few specific types of cancer, prostate cancer and ovarian cancer predominantly, where high fat, and I should have also said some um, breast cancers. So prostate, breast, and ovarian are three types of cancer for, for whom, people for whom, high fat dairy, meaning full fat, three or more servings a day may have some risks. Now, I really want you to leave today with the bottom line, because like I said, when, you, when you're trying to sort this out, like, do I have a latte or not? 
the bottom line is low fat or fat free milk, depending on your taste preferences, that is at it in, in a quantity of two or fewer servings a day for almost everyone is a safe thing to do. I can say more about specifics if you're feeling confused after this, but I really want to say that all of the noise in the research about whether dairy is good or bad, most of the time, like I said, there is not a problem with having a serving of dairy a day. And I put what a serving is at the bottom of this slide. So it's eight ounces of milk or kefir. I'm, I'm you know, highlighting kefir and fermented dairy products just a bit because of the preliminary work that's going on in the human microbiome and how that gut friendly gut flora can potentially have a beneficial effect as well. And a serving of yogurt is six ounces of plain yogurt, four ounces of cottage cheese, which is a half a cup or an ounce of cheese. The fastest way to estimate an ounce of cheese is basically the, the size of a thumb, the average size of a thumb. So this is another action step you can take. Thinking about your day, are you typically having more than two servings of dairy a day? And if so, is it high or full fat? If so, you may want to decide to make some adjustments there. And this is a time when I have a lot of people who ask me about dairy alternatives. What about things that like um, soy milk or almond milk? Those can be great alternatives. And then you can still continue to have some low fat dairy in your life um, and use some almond milk or soy milk or hemp milk or whatever kinds of other milks you like. Um, and we can talk more about those as well if people want. So myth number three, soy and cancer. And I would say the times I'm asked about soy most often are for people who have a personal history of estrogen receptor positive breast cancer. So I'm going to talk in terms that for those of you who, who don't have experience with or a family history ever know somebody that has what's called ER positive breast cancer, um, you can just ignore this lingo if it's feeling like a little overwhelming. And for those of you for whom this is your journey, I want to really dive in for a moment so you can feel like you have a con comfortable answer to this somewhat um, murky question. We now have 35 years of great research, not preliminary research, on how soy foods impact human health, specifically cancer. And I'm talking about before people are diagnosed with cancer and after they're diagnosed with cancer. The first term I wanna throw out for you to consider is called isoflavones. Isoflavones, for those of you who are familiar with this term, um, the, the specific things I'm talking about are genistein and daisine. Isoflavones are the part of soy foods that are the plant version of estrogen. I wanna be clear, plant version is not the same as human version and the plant version of estrogen is a thousand times weaker than human estrogen. So if you have heard or read that tofu can behave like estrogen in the human body, that is not the case. Human estrogen and tofu are nowhere near the same molecular structure and nowhere, nowhere near the same potency. The early research on soy was done in animals. Well, first test tubes and then animals. An interesting fact is that animals metabolize soy differently than humans. Unfortunately, that means that the buildup of isoflavones in animals is far greater than it is in humans. So the early research that suggested that isoflavones in animals could promote breast cancer is actually not relevant to humans at all. And it's only in the past, like I said, 30 some years of research in humans that we've gotten really clear on this. In 2019, a meta-analysis was published. That means they've taken a look at basically the entire body of research on soy in humans before breast cancer and after breast cancer. And really what I care about talking with you today is like what happens after a diagnosis of breast cancer. And here's the bottom line. Having tofu, edamame, soy milk is safe even for people who have estrogen receptor positive breast cancer. It's safe to have every day and it's safe to have in food form. So that means tofu, like I said, edamame, soy milk, miso soup, whatever it is that you like, 
And it's even reasonable for people to have the protein powders. For many years, women, and, and not only women have ER positive breast cancer, by the way, so people with breast cancer were encouraged not to do soy protein powder because it was a concentrated source. This is even something that we believed to be true for the research for a long time. But the best and latest, most comprehensive research suggests that the risk of death from breast cancer is actually lower in people who have a moderate intake of soy. Now, what does that mean? Specifically, it means that people who had every five grams of soy they, that people eat was linked with a 12% lower, um, lower risk of death from all causes and also breast cancer. So again, this, this protection is real. I will say that protection is best the earlier we start eating soy. So for most of us in adulthood, you know, unless we started eating soy when we were kids, we may, we may not get that big of a benefit. But the research even shows that uh, the, the Shanghai study in particular, where they've looked at adult women, even women who are eating soy, starting to eat soy in adulthood, can lower breast cancer risk by 22%. So these numbers are very clear. There's no ambiguity whatsoever about whether or not soy is safe. Um, and so, you know, I, I meet a lot of people who are sort of like, say, I don't like tofu. You don't have to start eating tofu. You don't have to start drinking soy milk. In fact, it's the earliest exposure in life that might offer the most protection. So I also have a lot of clients who ask me like, is this a good idea for if they have a personal history of breast cancer themselves, is it important for them to think about doing some tofu for their children? And I would say that the research does suggest that yes, having some plant protein that includes soy if possible is one way to help provide a preventive angle um, for perhaps yourself and also your family members or other loved ones. Um, who, who may want to reduce uh, cancer risk in this way. But the really important thing for you to hear is that if you've been afraid of soy or you've been staying away from tofu stir fry because you've been worried that it could act like estrogen in the body, that, that the research is really clear that there is a, the benefit of soy is far more significant than any potential risk. And this is not just true for breast cancer, but I want to be really clear that even with people with ER breast cancer, this is a safe thing to do. Okay. Myth number four, red meat and processed meat. I'm gonna start with red meat and define what I mean when I say red meat. Red meat includes steak, ground you know, hamburgers, veal, pork chops, which I know you might be saying, wait a second, I thought that was the other white meat. Pork chop, the nutritional profile of pork, all pork um, is more like red meat than chicken and fish. So it is considered a red meat um, for, for our purposes. Lamb, mutton, goat, et cetera. Bison, that's a red meat too. The research is also really clear on this, that the goal would be to cut your red meat intake down to three servings a week or less, and a serving size after cooking is about a deck of cards portion size. Now, some people, when they hear that, think that sounds like a lot of red meat, and other people think that sounds like so little. So really, the goal of today is for you to think about your own eating pattern, your individual intake of red meat, and see if you're at that level or less. If you're already eating less than or three servings a week, choose lean cuts, and it's a reasonable thing to keep. There's no increased risk of cancer, uh, developing cancer or cancer progression at red meat intakes that are less than three servings a week. Now let's move to the top of the slide where you see an orange avoid processed meat. Where risk tends to be very consistent is when people are regularly eating processed meats. So I'm talking about deli ham, salami, bacon, um, sausage, hot dogs. Processed meats are something best avoided or, or really minimized. So if you absolutely love BLTs and you can find, let's say a nitrate-free turkey bacon and cut your intake of those down to once or twice a month, that is a reasonable thing to do. Processed meats are in fact associated with increased risk of cancer. And it, it's not a one-off. It's not like if you you know never have a hot dog again, but really thinking about if that's if, if if processed meats are part of your regular routine, your regular grocery list, um, those are the kinds of things to work on minimizing processed meats less so than red meat. And lastly, we're gonna talk about supplements. Um, and I'm happy to, I'm checking the time. So I see we have plenty of time for Q&A, which is what I was hoping for. Supplements is a, uh, it's a bit of a, Oh, it's a large topic, let's just say. I could think I could talk for an hour just about supplements and cancer. Here's the bottom line. I'll give you the bottom line right away. 
Supplements do not prevent or cure diseases. End of story period. Supplements can be useful and necessary to replace things in people's eating patterns that they can't get from food or that they don't get from food on a regular basis. So the best way to find out whether or not a supplement is right for you is to work one-on-one -on -one with our dietitians at Dana-Farber because they can really help guide you alongside your provider, your medical oncologist, to, to understand whether or not supplements are necessary for you. So let me just give two examples. And I'm, I'm going back to what I said earlier about if you go online and you start to search for stuff, you can feel really confused. On the left-hand side of the slide, I'm showing you a study from, from Dana-Farber actually, that high dose vitamin C is beneficial for people with advanced colorectal cancer. And on the right-hand side of the slide, I'm showing you another study, this one not from Dana-Farber, but a study that shows vitamin E and selenium supplements in men can increase the risk of prostate cancer. So this is one of those like, this one study said this one thing, and this other st study said this other thing, and what am I supposed to do about it? Should I be avoiding vitamins? Should I be looking to get vitamin D or not take vitamin E? And how can you come up with an individually relevant supplement regimen? Well, the bottom line, as I mentioned, is to talk with your provider. And if you're a Dana-Farber patient, work one-on-one -on -one with our Dana-Farber team because they're you know, excellent at helping you understand specifically what supplements may be beneficial for you. But the three supplements I'm asked about most often are vitamin D, omega-3, and turmeric. So I wanna just go kind of a brief brush stroke on each of these. And then of course, with questions, happy to answer more as time permits. Vitamin D, you may have heard a lot about when it comes to cancer because we have close to 45 years worth of research now that suggests vitamin D has a preventive role when it comes to cancer. That is true. Vitamin D deficiency is a risk for cancer. And vitamin D is a hard thing to get from food. Here's a chart of foods that have vitamin D in them. So you can just peruse this. I won't read to you off the chart, but you know, you see here that herring, Atlantic herring, three ounces, which is a deck of cards, is like the highest concentration of vitamin D. Look at the bottom. Milk is a hundred international units per cup. I want you to think about that for a second because vitamin D enriched milk is one of the things that people often think of as a good source of vitamin D. The thing is that in New England, I, I'm actually gonna back up a second and show you this map. Okay, look on the left side of the slide and you see that red line that's on there? It says 37th parallel. That is the longitudinal line where vitamin D deficiency anywhere north of that line in the gray shaded area, so Boston, is a higher likelihood of vitamin D deficiency in the winter months. Winter months, what the winter months are is November through April. So we're like peak season vitamin D deficiency time in New England right now, meaning we are too far from the equator to synthesize vitamin D from the sun. So that's the other place people get vitamin D. If you were to go outside in the summer in New England with sleeveless for 15 minutes with your face and your arms exposed, you'd get about 2000 international units of vitamin D. That's 20 glasses of milk. Now, as a cancer dietitian, I'm really an advocate for skin protection as well and sun protection, so sunscreen. So we don't want to encourage people, even in the summer months, to say, oh, well, I was hearing about how I need to get vitamin D, so now I'm just going to go out without sunscreen. That is not an effective way to get vitamin D. And this, is, this points us in the direction of, for many people in New England, this is the time of year that their vitamin D levels start to drop or plummet in some instances. A normal level of vitamin D in the bloodstream is 20 to 80 nanograms per deciliter. So and depending on where you get your blood drawn and where what laboratory is assessing for it, 20 to 80 is a rough range. It's nice if you can have a vitamin D level in your blood around 40 or 50. But in New England, vitamin D levels can get down like as low as four or 10. And when that happens, you won't, well, first of all, you wouldn't know it unless you had a blood test done. So a conversation you might have with your primary care doctor is to have an annual vitamin D level checked. The specific blood test is the one I've listed for you on this slide. It's vitamin D3. 
the active form of vitamin D. My recommendation to all cancer survivors is to have this level checked once a year with your primary care doctor. It's not the kind of thing to ask your medical oncologist to do for two reasons. Someday, hopefully you won't be needing your medical oncologist and this needs to be in your primary care physician's record. And we need to track this over time. And your primary care is gonna be the best person to help you do that. So vitamin D3 level is a blood test that can be done that helps us understand if your blood level is around 30 or 40. And if it's really more like 10 or in the teens, that's a time when you may need to be taking a vitamin D supplement. Because as you can see here, even if you drink 20 glasses of milk, that would be, it may be difficult for you to replete your levels. I'll say one more thing. And if I'm, if it's, if this is feeling too overwhelming, please feel just like take a deep breath, stand up and do a jumping jack. But for those of you who, for whom this is a concern, I want to be really specific. It takes about a thousand international units of supplement to raise someone's blood level about 10 points. So let's say your level was 10, but we wanted it to be more like 20, 30 or 40. That's not something that's easily achieved through food alone. And it definitely requires a conversation with your primary care physician. And if you have one, your oncology dietitian, hopefully you do have one. If, if you don't after today, I'm hoping to convince you to get one because these are the kinds of guidelines that really we can't offer a blanket statement that everyone should take 2000 international units of vitamin D because everyone's different. Everyone's vitamin D level is different. Everyone's vitamin D intake is different. And maybe you don't even live north of 37 degrees parallel. The fact that we do virtual programming means now I have, we have people from all over the globe. So some people actually are living in climates or places where vitamin D deficiency is not as prevalent as it is in the Northeast. So vitamin D is an example of a supplement that can be beneficial, but definitely necessitates a conversation with your provider and team. Let's move on to omega-3s because I meet a lot of people who have heard that fatty fish are beneficial for anti-inflammatory effects. And that's true. And then they say, I hate fish. I don't really like salmon or my kids won't eat it. And I can't make two separate meals, which, you know, that that's real. So the recommendations for eating fish are try to eat fish twice a week, a three ounce portion of fish, the fattier, the fish, the better, because it has more omega threes, but the vegetarian sources of omega threes are also listed on the slide. For some people, they don't like any of these foods. And that would be a conversation again with your provider and your dietitian to find out whether or not omega-3 fat supplement is right for you. Omega-3 fatty acid supplements and all supplements are not something to start on your own, especially based on this conversation, because there are risks associated with some things. You know, um, omega-3 fatty acids can thin the blood if taken in high doses. For people who are taking blood thinners, that's a contradiction. So we wanna be really clear that the conversation about supplements, you can see why it's so complicated, right? But is there a specific cancer benefit? The jury is really still out on that. Omega-3 fats provide us heart health and, 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 and benefit for that as well as cognitive, so brain health. Um, and there is some indication that omega-3 fats from food have an anti-inflammatory effect, which may be beneficial toward cancer. We don't yet know if taking a supplement can give the same effect. So really, again, that brings me back home to the priority here to aim for food sources wherever you possibly can. If you're concerned or you don't like the food sources, that would be an opportunity to have a conversation with your provider about whether or not a supplement is right for you. Same with turmeric. Turmeric, really potent antioxidant and anti-inflammatory food. That's for, you can see here, I have up on the uh, upper left-hand corner for you, a picture of the actual turmeric root. Um, which looks like ginger. If you've ever bought fresh ginger in the grocery store, it's kind of like knobby and, you know, the thin paper, thin peel. Turmeric looks a lot like that in its, in its root form. I think many people are familiar, uh, more familiar with the dried spice that you might have in your spice cabinet. And of course, people ask me, how much turmeric do I need? Well, however much you can put into your cooking is the answer, um, because we don't yet know if turmeric and food in supplement form delivers the same type of benefit as it does in food form. So my invitation would be for you to explore cooking more with turmeric. I have a recipe here that Becca is going to put into the chat for everybody. This is just one of a lot of recipes that we have um, for you on my Zate gum that are turmeric. Um, in fact, there's even a couple of videos that are how to cook with turmeric, what to do with it, etc. But this one, if you've never, if you have turmeric in your spice cabinet and you have never found a thing that you like to cook with it, 
I mean, ho hopefully you'll get into exploring things like curries and, and whatnot, but if that's not your flavor preference, this would be the recipe that I would encourage you to start out with, provided you like cauliflower. It's a recipe by a couple cooks and it's called crispy breaded cauliflower. It's got four different dried spices in it. It comes together really quickly. Um, and it, I now have taken, I have two kids um, and I've had to start making two heads of cauliflower when I make this um, because it's so delicious. It's baked. Um, there's a little sauce that you make first with peanut butter and soy sauce. It's like a, a little liquid that you take the broccoli, uh, cauliflower florets rather and coat them in. And then this uh, panko breadcrumb mixture with turmeric and other spices. Um, and then you uh, roast it in the oven and it is delectable. So I wanna really encourage you if you um, haven't ex experimented with turmeric before this, and this recipe, I, I think is a real winner. The other place you can put turmeric is just in salad dressing. So I make a homemade balsamic salad dressing, which is balsamic vinegar, olive oil, Dijon mustard. Um, and I put um, a half a teaspoon of turmeric in that with a little sea salt. Um, and you can also, if you have a salad dressing you already like that's not homemade, um, let's say you have like half a bottle of salad dressing. Well, maybe you have a Caesar or a, um, I'm just really any kind of salad dressing. If you have half a bottle of salad dressing in your fridge, you can take out your turmeric from the spice cabinet and put a half a teaspoon, or maybe you want to start smaller, a third of a teaspoon of turmeric just right into the bottle and shake it up. It's going to make it a little bit more of an orange color, but just adding turmeric like that to your salad dressing. So anytime you're having a salad, you've got some turmeric in it. That's another just quick hack for getting turmeric in, in an, on a regular basis. Okay, let's sum up with how all these myths and facts show up on your dinner plate. Like what are the things to eat more of and the things to eat less of? So ideally a dinner plate, let's, or a lunch plate, what have you, would look like this healthy eating plate from Harvard School of Public Health. On the left-hand side of the plate where the green and red sides are, you're looking for three servings of vegetables, two servings of fruit a day. On the right-hand side of the plate, you're looking to choose whole grains and limit white processed things. So brown rice instead of white rice, whole wheat pasta instead of white pasta, et cetera. And in the orange section, proteins that are lean, like fish, skinless chicken, tofu, beans, and avoid processed meats. You'll see healthy oils in the upper left-hand corner, like olive oil, and hydration that's primarily water, tea, or coffee with little to no added sugar. I already mentioned dairy, if you're choosing cow's dairy, low fat, two or fewer servings a day, and do your best to eliminate or avoid sugar-sweetened beverages. Moving your body in a way that's fun and sustainable for you is also key. And I just want to highlight for those of you who aren't familiar with the MyZecom platform around physical activity, we have a tremendous team of exercise physiologists and a nutrition, a nutrition, exercise physiologist you can meet on one-on-one -on -one, just like you can meet with a nutritionist one-on-one. -on -one. Okay, so I've already said what to eat more of, what to eat less of, and I am going to take I'm going to stop because I wanted to have at least 20 minutes for questions and we're just about one minute shy of that. Uh, so I'm going to invite Becca back to join us. Um, and I see we have some questions in, and great in Q&A and chat. So Becca, I'm going to just let you fire away with the questions. We'll get to as many as we can. Perfect. Great job. This was an amazing presentation. Um, the recipe also looks delicious. So I did put the link to it in the chat. I'm very excited to try it out myself. So I'm gonna scroll up and get back to the earlier questions. All right. So if a patient um, has recently become lactose intolerant, is there a difference between various cheeses raw versus cooked? And also is there a way to easily introduce lactose into their diet? Mm. If you're lactose intolerant and you know it, and let me just say, most people know it. <laughs> um, it's not, it, it, you know, you, anyway, I, I won't go too much more in depth, but if you are truly lactose intolerant, it's probably going to be a, a good idea not to try to reintroduce lactose. Um, and what that means is that your body is just, lactose is a specific type of sugar in dairy that some people can't digest and absorb. And when they eat it, it tends to cause loose stool in addition to like a lot of just like turbulence and upset stomach and nausea. And it can be really uncomfortable for people. But there are lots of really great lactose-free products on the market. Um, and, and there's lots of brands I can mention a few. Um, 
so so let me just I'm thinking about whether I can share my screen again I think I can right okay let's yes do you this. should be able to this will be fun and I like I really want to make this as interactive as possible so let me yeah. stop my slides um sorry I want to Okay, well, let me start giving you some brands because that's for some reason my slides are still deciding to be the primary thing that comes up when I do this. Um, so Daya, D-A-I-Y-A is one example of a lactose-free brand. Other people may have ideas that they want to share, but my recommendation, the, the hard, I think the question was specifically around cheese too. The harder the cheese, the less lactose. So like a Parmesan, like the kind that's like on a really hard wheel that you would have to grate yourself. Um, that kind of cheese is the lowest amount of lactose. The highest amount of lactose is in the really soft cheeses like brie. So even people who are lactose intolerant, depending on the degree of severity, can sometimes tolerate a hard cheese in a small quantity. But otherwise, I would probably recommend either lactose-free dairy items or a plant-based dairy alternative. Um, Ripple, so I mentioned Daya, mm -hmm. D-A-Y-I-A. Ripple, R-I-P-P-L-E, is another, it's it's a dairy alternative that's made from pea, peas. Um, and so there, each of these lines has all the products, right? Cottage cheese, cream cheese, shredded cheese, milk, yogurts, that kind of thing. So looking for an alternative for lactose um, is, is an important thing to stay consistent with, especially if you're getting symptoms. Yeah. Great. And thank you for those suggestions. I will say I'm a vegetarian myself and I try to avoid dairy as much as possible to be as close to vegan as I can get. And those two brands, Daya and Ripple, are fantastic alternatives from my experience as well. Any others, Becca, that you would add? Um, Trader Joe's, if anybody has a Trader Joe's near them that they like to frequent, they have their brand makes amazing cheese alternatives. Those happen to be my best, my favorite. Their Parmesan's really good. Their mozzarella, um, they have shredded mozzarella that is just fantastic on pizzas and stuff. So I'm a big frequent flyer Trader Joe's, especially their vegan options. Yeah, okay, good, thank you. Yeah, of course. <laughs> um, the next question, what are added sugar guidelines for men? Mm, might 36, be a broad one. Yep, you know, 36 mm -hmm. grams or less a day. Okay. You know what I didn't mention earlier that I wanna tell people? Cause some people are like, well, what about like if I'm adding sugar to my coffee at home? I didn't mention one teaspoon. Like everybody think about your baking drawer, your teaspoon, little teaspoon. One teaspoon is four grams of sugar. So, you know, because I talked only about how you can read it on a label. Like if you look at your yogurt and it says 16 grams of added sugar and you're a man trying to keep your intake at 36 grams or less, but you want to know how many, let's say you're making your, you're doing plain yogurt, but putting a little honey in it. Let's actually use that example. If you have plain yogurt at home and you put in one teaspoon of honey, the added sugar quantity is four grams. If you compare that to yogurt, you get in the grocery store that's already flavored, that's got 16 grams of added sugar. You see how you can quite quickly take your added sugars and cut them like down to just a fourth. So if the, the answer to the question is 36 grams of added sugar for men a day or less. Less is more. So, and kids, for those of you who have children two and under, Ideally, the goal is zero grams of added sugar at that age. And then from kids, from kids age two to adulthood, the goal is the same as for women, which is 24 grams or less a day of added sugar. Great. Thank you. And the next comment is a suggestion. This is a fantastic suggestion. Um, so this attendee says that a friend and I came up with a healthier alternative to sweet potato pie or sweet potato casserole this morning. You bake a sweet potato and drizzle it with a little honey, which you just mentioned, and okay. molasses, which sounds delicious. Yeah. So thank you for that suggestion. Love it. And a little sea salt. Mm, I'm, that's, Ooh. yeah, it sounds delicious. Good job. <laughs> Let's do it. Um, so we have a question specific to the soy segment. Yes. This question is, when I eat soy, I end up feeling like I have PMS all the time. So I drastically cut down how much I eat. How does that relate to the soy and cancer non-connection? Hmm. So it does, I mean, it, for that individual, it might just be an intolerance to something. And so, you know, uh, which is, which is possible, by the way, you can be, mm -hmm. you can be allergic to soy. So it might just be an intolerance in that regard. And don't think that it relates to the, the, uh, I, I'm wondering if the person's asking if there is some estrogenic effect that they're noticing yeah. in their yeah. body. Yeah. And that it's, it's important to understand that what we believe to be true with regard to the estrogenic effect 
is that soy appears to block receptor sites on a breast cancer cell. That's how it is preventive. So it isn't to say that there's no uh, estrogenic like activity mm -hmm. with soy, but the amount of soy hu a human can consume would be impossible to actually make cancer grow. Does that make sense? Yes, I think that I hope that's clear. I hope that's clear. Okay, yeah. So I don't know that there's def def definitely definitely mm -hmm. a connection for this particular individual. They may just be sensitive to the to soy itself, and, and and in that case, obviously, no need to try to go for it. You know, there's, yes. <laughs> there's not a okay. Good. Yeah, you great. don't and have to. Is, you don't have to eat more soy. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and this is a great example of um, being able to be in contact with the nutritionist, especially at Dana Farber. They can really help you out with specific things for yourself. Um, and oh, I should say this, Becca, while I have a chance, yes. um, that I want to give the phone number for people who are Dana Farber patients and haven't yet met with one of our incredible yeah. team members one on one or in person and or virtually, if I can, which is 617. I see Becca's already typing. Thanks, Becca. Yes. <laughs> 617 Perfect. And I just put that in the chat as well. Thanks, Becca. Of course. Scrolling back up. Um, all right, this next question. Can you confirm that everything you say about soy for those with ER positive breast cancer is also true for those with ER positive endometrial or other gynecologic cancers? Oh, I'm great. assuming so, but you just want, but just wanted to confirm given your emphasis on breast cancers. This I is a great love one. that you, thank you so much for asking that because so often I do get right down the path of breast cancer because that's for the most of my 25 years in this job. Well, the fear has been so much around whether or not soy mm -hmm. could be, could be could foster, quite frankly, breast cancer growth. And I, I'm really di I'm rem remiss in not having addressed the fact that also people want to know about cancers of the reproductive tract. So ovarian, fallopian, endometrial, et cetera. And yes, it's really key to know that the estrogenic effects of soy that we worried about for many years could make breast cancer grow do not have the same impact whatsoever on ovarian, fallopian, endometrial cancers, any of the gynecological cancers. So yes, for people with uh, GYN cancers, it is not a concern um, to consume soy. Thank you for that question. Great. Um, so the next question, it says, what about tea and coffee, especially green, black, or caffeine free? Love it. Okay. This is a great one. So green tea, super. Um, the research on green tea is really interesting. It suggests that having green tea, you know, even up to like four cups a day, if you feel, if you're inclined to drink green tea has some really potential of protection against specific types of cancer. Coffee, there's a kind of interesting story about coffee. Coffee, um, there's a lot of research on coffee and it is also the benefits of coffee far outweigh any potential risk. Remember, um, many of you may have heard like for a while, for a few years ago, there was this thing about coffee needs to have a warning label because it contains something called acrylamide. Acrylamide is a chemical that forms when coffee beans are roasted. Acrylamide is also in French fries, potato chips, it's in toast. It's anything that's got that crispy roasted uh, a carbohydrate kind of thing. But Ed Giovannucci and colleagues at Harvard School of Public Health have been studying acrylamide specifically in coffee in humans for a while now. And it's great news for those who love coffee because they have looked at blood levels of acrylamide in people who drink coffee and cancer risk. And there's like, no, there's no clear association. In fact, this is just like the thing I said about soy. All the preliminary research was done in laboratory animals and laboratory animals don't metabolize acrylamide like humans do. They, it builds up and it's unfortunately the research that originally caused a lot of fear around coffee when it comes to cancer is really not research that can be generalized to humans whatsoever. And the research in humans, we have like 30 years of research in humans and, uh, on cancers, that coffee is safe for cancer survivors and also perhaps preventive in terms of most types of cancer. So, okay to have your cup of coffee. I would also just say, don't only drink coffee. You know, I mean, <laughs> coffee is a caffeinated beverage. So the recommendations that the research says up to five cups a day, I, I tend to go more like trying to encourage people to drink two cups of coffee a day and make sure that they hydrate themselves effectively with other things. And of course, I hope it goes without saying that that coffee, the benefits of coffee are, are black coffee, not coffee with cream and added sugar. So 
just like that's one other little caveat maybe. Great, thank you for that. All right, um, the next question might be a specific one to talk with your care team about, but I'll open it up. Um, what are the options for vitamin D3 intake for those who are missing their intestines? Ah, yes, I will give an answer to this, but I do wanna encourage the person who has the um, question to just make sure with their physician that this is the right choice for them. Um, but it's a specific product. And also I should say this, myself and Dana Farber do not have any affiliations, alliances, or promotional interest in, in products whatsoever. So what I'm giving you is just advice I would give to a person one-on-one. -on -one. And again, this is meant to be offered in the context of talking with your provider. The product is called Carlson's Vitamin D Drops. Um, and I will, um, I can type that in the chat. Oh, no, I can't, but you can probably, Becca. Carlson's vitamin D drops are concentrated drops, meaning one drop, it looks like a tiny little essential oil bottle, a black, a dark brown glass bottle that has a variety of strengths. So you, in, in one drop of vitamin D from Carlson's, you can get anywhere from 1,000, 2,000 up to 5,000 in a drop. So this is really gonna be um, important for people to, to make sure you have the blood test done and you're working with a provider who can help you understand what the right dose for you will be. And then to have your blood level checked again, 12 weeks later to see if it work, it's working. It takes 12 weeks for blood levels to recalibrate after somebody starts a vitamin D supplement. So the best way, the first pass, at least for somebody who has a um, portion of their intestines removed is to try vitamin D3 drop in drop form and then work with their provider to make sure that their levels are normalizing. Great. All right. And it was Carlson's with a C? Yes, C-A-R-L. Okay. And it's, that's widely available online and at Whole mm -hmm. Foods, but you wanna make sure before you start taking it that you're talking with your doctor. Perfect. All right. Uh, is there any concern about mer mercury in fish mm -hmm. for cancer patients? Great question. Methylmercury is not associated with cancer per se, but there are five fish that are the highest methylmercury contributors to our diet. Let's see if I can remember that off the top of my head. Um, king, king mackerel, shark, tilefish, tuna steaks, not tuna in the can, and one more. Ha did I? What did I Swordfish. Say? Swordfish. Thank you, Lauren. <laughs> Good. Great. Thank you very much. So those five fish are types of fish to eat no more than once a month. But let me just be clear. That's not because the risk is there's a straight line from that to cancer. It's actually more that there seem to be risks for cognitive, um, uh, de cognitive decline issues over lifespan if you're eating more than that quantity of methylmercury. So it's, you know, I hope that, I hope that helps. I, I didn't say that why tuna in the can is lower mercury. And I'll just really quickly tell you mm -hmm. why. Tuna steak has a higher methylmercury than tuna in the can because the little teeny tiny tunas are the ones um, that get thrown back, right? But, and they get eaten by the bigger fish. So the smaller the fish, the lower its methylmercury is. The bigger predator type fish that eat other fish accumulate more mercury in their, in their flesh. So that's mm -hmm. why those fish that we talked about, like shark, tilefish, um, swordfish, those are larger like mm -hmm. steaks. Great. All right, so we have two questions about turmeric, so I'll put them in one. Do you receive benefit from, do you receive a benefit from usually ground turmeric instead of the whole root? And how much turmeric do we need for it to be effective? Great question. We don't know the answer to the second one, like okay. meaning if I could answer that, I would be getting a Nobel prize. But um, <laughs> the, the first question is how do you, get, do you get a benefit from the spice in addition to the root? And the answer is absolutely yes. And also it's even more so if you use ground pepper with your turmeric. For those of you who like curries or cook curry on, on a regular basis, you know how often curries have some heat to them, a little spice? That is phenomenal because a little bit of pepper or spiciness is what improves the absorption of turmeric. So when you're cooking turmeric, like I mentioned, putting it in your salad dressing, add some ground pepper to your salad, because that's going to help you absorb whatever turmeric you do eat. But to answer your question, we don't have a, a specific number of, of grams or milligrams or teaspoons to try to aim for a day. Try to get it in as regularly as you can. Um, that's why I mentioned the salad dressing idea. Some people do a turmeric tea. 
they make a okay. tea. There's lots of recipes for that online too. And that becomes their afternoon uh, tea ritual. So lots of ways to think about getting turmeric in your eating pattern if you can. Great. All right. Um, if you, if you use sunscreen, can you still absorb vitamin D? Good question. No. Sunscreen does block out UV rays that help you to synthesize vitamin D, but it's important to use. So when we're talking with people, if they're you, if the summer months, they want to try to get some vitamin D from the sun, it's really no more than like 10 to 15 minutes in the sun without sunscreen and then apply sunscreen, put on your hat, protect your skin. Because unfortunately sun exposure is a cancer risk. It's a very mm -hmm. delicate balance. So, um, I wouldn't say, yeah, I hope that answers the question. Yeah. I know we're running low on time. So I want to get a few more. Yeah. <laughs> Are oats a whole grain? I don't like brown rice or whole wheat bread that much, but I love oats. Is that yes. a good thing for me to focus on? It sure is. And oats it did come in lots of different varieties, right? There's the steel cut oats all the way down to this more um, refined oats. So yes, oats are a whole grain. And if you're inclined to steel cut, or if you um, are able to try steel cut oats, those are going to give you the most um, fiber and protein. Uh, and I'll just also, again, no, Becca and I are both mentoring Trader Joe's now. Again, no affiliations or brands. Trader Joe's has an excellent quick cook steel cut oats. Um, so that would be one I, to try for people who like oats. Great. All right. Is deli meat from a brand name, no added preservatives? Um, okay to eat every day in a sandwich? So deli meat is tricky. It does mm -hmm. technically count as processed meat. And I'm not sure if it's turkey or red meat or it actually in some respects doesn't matter. We also don't know when it comes to deli meat, if it's the nitrates that are the problem or the high temperatures, like there's really, deli meat's an interesting thing. I would, my advice would be whenever possible, do the home roasted version of whatever deli meat you're eating on a regular basis. So if it's a roast beef sandwich, you can buy a roast and bake it yourself and slice it or buy a turkey breast and bake it yourself and slice it even once a month to mix it up and lower the amount of deli meat you eat on a regular basis. That can be key. If it's turkey that is the smoked or cured or, you know, the mesquite kind of thing, that definitely will count as a processed meat. So you're really looking for the plain oven roasted off the bone kind of turkey if it's turkey. So I hope that helps get clear on that. Yeah. All right. Um, how much ground flaxseed is good to have daily? Ah, good question. Ground flaxseed is in a, a plant version of omega-3 fats like we talked about before. And if you're using it, I would not exceed three tablespoons in a day. So one or two tablespoons a day, and you can add it to cereal, to salads, to um, smoothies, um, but it does have some fiber and some good phytonutrients in it. And oh, by the way, keep it in the fridge. Or if you buy it ground, keep the whole bag in the freezer. Omega-3 fats are very volatile. They, they go rancid really quickly. So you don't wanna keep your flax seed, your hemp seed, your chia seeds in the cabinet. You wanna keep those in the freezer or at the very least the fridge. Great. All right, there's still so many more questions. Um, so the next two are talking about plant-based uh, plant-based alternatives. So the first one is, can you talk to us about fake meat, beyond meat, impossible burgers, et cetera, are things like tofu versus things like tofu or tempeh. Are there any caveats to these fake meats? Should we think about them as we do the rest of the soy products? Also, can you remind us how much soy is safe slash okay to eat per week? And then the question right after this is, um, oh, how do I get enough iron and calcium from food sources that my body can easily absorb if I am a vegetarian? So I figured I would lump those together. Okay, here we go. This will be our last and we'll do this big, yes. I'll do lightning round on all of these. <laughs> Impossible fake meat. There's no caveat, but there's also no benefit. There's a benefit if you were a red meat eater who's eating less red meat. Does that make sense? So if you're using it to replace hamburgers because you used to eat hamburgers five times a week and now you're only eating hamburgers three times a week like I was mentioning and you're eating impossible burgers the other two times then yeah your benefit is really trying to get yourself down to that three or below red meat but if you were never a burger eater anyway there's no real benefit to starting the fake meats um next question was about how does that compare to tofu I think yes it doesn't so it, it doesn't really, um, but there, there really are no caveats there. There's no harm that comes from those particular foods. They're more, like I said, to, if you're using them as a replacement for, for red meat. Um, Becca, fresh, fresh, refresh me on the next portion of that. Um, how to get enough iron in a diet oh. as a vegetarian. Yes. Um, good question. Leafy greens is the fast mm -hmm. answer. 
Um, and that iron and calcium conversation is a phenomenal place to come to a one-on-one -on -one consultation with a dietitian because they can look at your three days of what you're eating and really quickly give you an a sense of where you may actually need to use a supplement. For some people, they use a vegetarian or vegan iron supplement or supplement their diet with calcium, but also that one-on-one -on -one consult can give you some really specific guidance around that. Great. Is there more? Is there more to that one or we got it? That was it for those two questions. And I know that there were some more. Um, please feel free to reach out um, with more questions. Um, I will finish this up and then stop the recording so we can um, start the poll real quick. So I want to thank you all for joining. Thank you, especially to Stephanie for this great and interactive presentation.